there, welcome to Skank Key Productions. I'm Crown Goes Cocon, let's get into the video. Today's video we're going to be continuing with our Disney series. Today's video we're going to be looking at none other than 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from 1954. So if you like the sound of that, don't forget obviously hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell button so you stay notified, and also don't forget to check out our many other videos in this playlist. I promise that you will not be disappointed. And also we have to give a massive shout out to everyone who left a comment in the last video and who hit the like button. So we're trying to go for 20 likes per video and we're also trying to go for people leaving a comment. So big shout out to everyone who left a comment and to everyone who left a like because this is going to obviously beat the algorithm. The channel is already slightly growing and now we want to basically speed that process up. So every little helps and uh, it will be very much appreciated. But for those of you who are new to the channel and have never seen any of our videos before, we have to let you know that we have it split into six different parts. So we have first of all the story of the story, the story of the creator, the story of the studio, the themes and the history, the legacy, and any notable lines and notable effects that take place within the film. So without further ado, we're going to dive straight now into the story of the story. So buckle up and let's go for the ride. So the story starts with a ship being rammed by a submarine. Before we see a bunch of people talking about a sea monster and we see Ned Land cussing them about their bad breath. Next we end up meeting Professor Aranax and his assistant Conciel as they board a US Navy frigate to catch the monster after being misquoted in the press for saying that the monster could exist. Now whilst on board they search the seas for many months only to find nothing. And so Ned Land ends up singing a song about it to cheer them all up before they come across a shipwreck which causes them to wonder what the cause of it is. Well, they don't have to wait for very long as they end up engaging in battle with a submarine which rams them and causes the Professor, Conciel and Ned to go overboard. Now as they're floating about, they end up boarding the submarine as it's parked on the surface I am not a naval expert, I have no idea what the actual technical term for that is, I'm calling it parking, it probably isn't parking. Leave a comment in the comment section if you actually figure out what it is, um, I have no idea, okay, I'm just going to say that straight out. And whilst they're on board, this is where they end up exploring inside, before seeing a diving team on the sea floor, who end up spotting them and then capturing them. Now this is where we meet Captain Nemo, who is the captain of the Nautilus, and he also happens to know of the professor. So he tests the professor by seeing if he's willing to drown with his companions before inviting them all to dine on some really strange food from the ocean floor. Now as time goes on, Ned discovers that Nemo has lots of treasure, but Aranax values scientific discovery over treasure. And so he tells Ned to behave and gets Conciel to spy on him. Next they end up going to a penal colony that Nemo had once been a prisoner to and so Nemo, in trying to get back at them, he ends up ramming the ship to stop the phosphates being used for war munitions. So the argument for this is basically of uh, saving thousands of lives for the sake of a few dozen. However, Conciel and Ned end up hacking his secrets and they send messages in bottles to get Navy support to capture Nemo. Before they end up on New Guinea, where they're almost eaten by cannibals, before Nemo electrocutes them. Now next, there ends up being a warship which attacks the ship and as they dive down to escape, this is where they come across a giant squid which attacks them and so Ned ends up saving Nemo by harpooning the monster which causes Nemo to have a change of heart that he's now going to save the world. But when reaching Volcania, this is where Nemo ends up setting off a time bomb after he ends up being surrounded by some marines and he's also shot in the process of this. And after Ned escapes, he runs the ship aground, leaving Nemo for dead and causing the ship to explode. So Ned ends up apologising for knocking out Professor Aranax and for losing him his journal. But Aranax said it's probably for the best. And so the film ends with the ominous words of Nemo. There is hope for the future. And when the world is waiting for a new, better life, all this will someday come to pass in God's good time. So, as you can see, that is the story of the story. But now we have to dive into the story of the creative process that went into the making, not just of the film, but also of the book which inspired it. So we should say that the story was originally made by a sci-fi writer, Jules Verne, who also authored A Journey to the Centre of the Earth, Around the World in 80 Days, and many other stories besides this. 
and he wrote this between 1869 and 1870, as it was serialized in a fortnightly periodical called the Magazine de Education et de Recreation. See, my French has got way better than it was back in the day. And we should say that it was finally published in 1871. Now, Disney ended up choosing the story in 1950, as he was inspired by the True Life Adventures series that contained many different shots of marine footage. And so in 1951, he bought the rights to the story from Sid Rogel, with storyboards from Harper Gough, who is uncredited due to the fact he was not a member of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. I should also say that the story was largely kept the same as it was in the original novel. The only differences being that in the film, the submarine, for instance, is nuclear powered. And we should also say as well that much of the story is actually streamlined and the actual event order of the different uh, scenes was switched about a little bit just to make it a more compelling story. And so that talks about the uh, story of the creative process. But now we have to talk about the story of the studio. So the film was entirely shot within the Bahamas and in Jamaica. And we should also say that filming of it began on January the 11th, 1954, and the film crew numbered over 400 people. And this was largely to do with the fact of the, you know, the sheer number of special effects which were in the film. So in particular, the giant squid scene, that had to be entirely reshot. And the reason for that is because when it was originally shot, it was actually in a very calm sea and it was shot at dusk as opposed to in the film where it's shot at twilight and it's obviously a very rough sea. Now the reason why they did this is twofold. First of all to add a bit of drama but then second of all it was mainly to do with the fact that there were so many cables that were coming out of this huge mechanical giant squid and so if they had more choppy seas this would cover much of this up. So that's another reason why I had to shoot the entire scene. And because of mishaps like that, as well as the fact they had such a huge casting, this ended up being the most expensive Hollywood film up until this point. And so this ties in nicely with the casting for this, which is absolutely brilliant. So first of all, we have to say that Ned Land, he is played by Kirk Douglas. So if you haven't seen Path of Glory or Spartacus, both of which are early Kubrick films, which we'll cover more in depth when we get onto the Kubrick series, yeah, he was the star in both of those films, and also I think that he does a really brilliant job playing Ned in this. Next, we should say that Captain Nemo is played by James Mason, who again appears in Lolita, which is another classic Kubrick film. And he also appeared in The Journey to the Centre of the Earth as well in 1959. Next, we have to talk about Paul Lucas, and he's the person who plays Professor Aronnax, and he appeared in 55 Days at Peking, and definitely go and check out our video on the other channel, uh, which look at uh, what if the scramble for China happens, right? So definitely go and check that video out for more information on that. Next, we have to talk about Conciel, and he is played by Peter Law, and he appeared in Casablanca, but then also appeared in Around the World in 80 Days. Next, we have to talk about Robert J. Wilk, and he plays the first mate in this, and he also appeared in Spartacus, and later would appear in Magnificent Seven. Next, you have to talk about Ted Corsia, and he plays Captain Farragut in this, and he also appears in The Killing from 1956, which again is another classic uh, Kubrick film. And I should also say as well, there were some other minor actors in this who weren't in anything particularly notable. And so with that, we have to conclude the story of the studio, but now we have to talk about the themes in the history of this story. So first of all, I would say that a major theme of this is one of morality. And actually, the entire film is very questionable in terms of there's not necessarily a hero. Everyone within it is an anti-hero. So whether it's Captain Nemo, who obviously, you know, he's trying to save the world, but he's doing it by like sinking like ships and killing people and stuff. So is he necessarily the good guy? Then if you look at Professor Aronnax, again, is he necessarily the good guy? Because the only reason he's kind of going along with all this is in pursuit of science. Is it Ned Land? Not really. I mean, he just is looking out for money and stuff but that's kind of all his motivation really is. He doesn't really care about anyone in particular. Even when he knocks out the professor at the end, it's not for any real deeper reason. It's not like he really cares about him. It's more just the professor's inconvenient. And so he'd rather just knock him out just to kind of like keep the ball rolling. So within that, there's a very questionable morality and it kind of spoke into the wider thing of at the time in the 19th century when this story originated, 
This is the Bell Epoch. And we covered this in more depth in our video on Aristocats. But in this era, this is where you had a great deal of inequality. And so this ties in with the theme of class within this, because as we can see, how Captain Nemo and the others talk about Ned Land, for instance, is very, very clear that they look down on him because, for instance, you know, the fact that he didn't have the proper table etiquette, the fact that Ned Land isn't exactly uh, what you call a gentleman as such. This kind of is reinforced time and time again. And actually, you can kind of understand why Ned Land is so focused on money, because in this era here, where there's very little social mobility, the only way that he would actually end up having his own ship is if he ended up becoming rich. So for him, he sees all the jewels there as a way of, you know, it's his ticket out of things. Whereas for all the others who were kind of born into wealth, they're kind of like, they don't really care about treasure because they've grown up with treasure. So for them, they're more focused on science or this and the other. Whereas for Ned, he's like, this is my one ticket out of all this mess. And actually, this was a driving theme uh, for many uh, different explorers at the time, because of course, this was the era of exploration. It's where Europeans were going all the way around the world and they were exploring different things. And of course, you know, the last parts of the map are being scientifically kind of whittled down. But still, you've kind of got these old uh, stories of like sea monsters and stuff. And so there's kind of this clash between the old world and the new world, yeah, in the sense of, you know, scientific endeavours. And then we should also say, of course, this is the Industrial Revolution. So the book, of course, is kind of focused more on the original Industrial Revolution and the huge technological changes that had there. But of course, the film being made in the 1950s was also in a period of great technological improvement, especially with regard to nuclear power. But it's given the warnings of, you know, the, some of the effects of this nuclear power. So... This is something which, you know, whether it's in the 19th century or whether it's in the 1950s, it still is very relevant to the people who were either watching it or reading it at the time because they were living through an era of great technological change and talking about some of the wide implications of that because mankind can either use it for great good or for great evil. And so there's a debate about the morality of this technology and what it's going to actually be used for. And so with that, that covers the themes and the history of it. And now let's talk about the legacy of the film. So we should say that this film was incredibly, incredibly expensive. As we've said here, it was already the most expensive uh, film that had been made by Hollywood up to that point. However, this didn't seem to matter too much because in the year 1954, it was the second highest grossing film in the world. And it was the third highest grossing film in the US and Canada. So it had a budget of $9 million, which went way, way over budget. But worldwide, it made $28.2 million at the box office. And in the US alone, it made $8 million. So you can see how this story here had a global reach, not just in America, but I mean, even within just America and Canada alone, it already pretty much made up the entire uh, revenue that it had from the uh, actual budget. So you can see, obviously, it's a very popular film. And actually, in more recent decades, they did try multiple times to actually do a, an actual a, you know, a remake of it. So especially in the 2010s, there were several different attempts from different studios to try and get the ball rolling on this. And to give you an idea of this, they wanted to have Will Smith as Captain Nemo, and they wanted to have either Brad Pitt or Channing Tatum as uh, Ned Land. So if this film had kind of actually taken place, it would have been quite an interesting film, of course. But for different reasons, the studios decided to go with safer bets. So for instance, you end up having uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and you end up having several other films which took place in that time anyway. And so as a result of that, the idea has been shelved, but it still could easily be redone because clearly there's still a lot of appetite for the actual story. And so with that, we have to conclude uh, talking about the uh, notable lines and notable effects. So first of all, we'll talk about the notable effects. Uh, this film here, a big part of the budget for it obviously went into the uh, special effects, but it actually paid off because one of its Academy Awards was for special effects, with the other being Best Art Direction for Colour. So this film here, bear in mind that it's 1954, actually has a lot of great angles, it has a lot of great uh, colour sequence, and the special effects for its time are really revolutionary. 
And so a lot of people would have been absolutely blown away whenever they've seen some of these shots, especially of being underwater because the camera technology at the time would have really struggled with it. So that concludes the uh, notable effects. And now talking about the notable lines. So the film is, for the most part, quite a serious film. However, we do have some notable lines. So you have this. Keep away from him, you noisy sea lawyer. Just want to smell his breath? I can already smell yours. <laughs> and you have this. What is it? It's my own recipe. Soti of unborn octopus. <laughs> Nothing here is fit to eat. And also you have this. Go ahead, hit me. Hit me. You mean that? Sure, go ahead. You can't miss it. <laughs> now we are friends. And so you can see it's a very, very good film. I would say, however, it does go on for a little bit too long. For a two hour long film, they easily could have cut out about half hour of this, in my opinion. I mean, once you've seen like one shot of like the sea, you've kind of seen them all. Like we get it. Yeah, they're underwater. Cool. Great. But they kind of overplay some of the shots a little bit too, too much. And it's like, yeah, just cut the film down a little bit, we get the gist of it. But regardless of whether you like the film or didn't like the film or you know haven't seen the film or have seen the film or thought it went too long or not long enough, regardless of all that, you know what you can do? You can, of course, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, hit the bell button so you stay notified, and also don't forget to stay tuned for our next video, which is going to be Swiss Family Robinson from 1960. So as I said in the previous video, we're eventually we're going to get onto that. So in two weeks time, come back here and you'll see uh, Swiss Family Robinson being covered. And in the meantime, have a great day and bye.